no place to hide this weary soul This bag of bones And I try with all my mind But I just can't win the fight I'm slowly drifting <laughs> Chips cashed in, keep trucking like the do dog man together. More or less in line, just keep trucking on. Arrows up the end and flashing my keys on a main street. Chicago, New York, Detroit, and it's all on the same street. City involved in a typical daydream. Hang it up and see what tomorrow brings. Dallas got a soft machine. Houston too close to New Orleans. New York got the ways and means, but just won't let you be. On the street, think of true love. Most of the time, they're sitting and crying alone. One of these days, they know they gotta get going. Out of the door, out on the streets, all alone. Trucking like a two dial man. Once told me you gotta play your hand. Sometimes the cards ain't worth the dime. Just don't lay them Shining on me Other times I can barely see Lately it occurs to me What a long, strange trip it's been What in the world Became a sweet Jane. She'll have to sparkle, you know she isn't the same. Living on reds, vitamin C, and low main. All a friend can say is, ain't it a shame? Trucking up to Buffalo, been thinking you got to mellow slow. Take time, you pick a place to go, and just keep trucking on. Hotel window Got a tip They're gonna kick the door in again I like to get some sleep Before I travel But if you got a want I guess you're gonna come in Busted Down a bourbon street Sit up Like a rolling pin Knock down It gets to wear and thin They just won't let you be Hanging around and you like to travel You're tired of traveling and you want to settle down I guess they can't revoke your soul for trying Get it out of the door and come out of it and look all around Sometimes the lights are shining on me
Good morning. We want to thank you for being here this morning at Horizon Worship. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Please stand and worship with us this morning. Sing along. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle 
for you have never failed me yet. Your promise still stands, great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands, this is my comfort. pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we know that you can make a way when there seems to be no way. We know with your love and your mercy and your guidance, Lord, that anything is possible. That if we're struggling, that if there's pain, if we're going through heartache, Lord, we can turn to you. We can turn to your love and your grace to give us peace. Comfort us, Lord. Make us feel whole. Make us feel at home here this morning. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. And at this time, the kids can go down to Kids Zone. So follow the adults downstairs. And at this time, I'd like to invite the baptismal family forward. All right. 
right, so you're there, you're there, you're there. And you're right there on that brown spot. Perfect, I oh, love it, all right, awesome. Well, we are so excited this morning. We actually have two baptisms. We had the first one this morning at our 845 service. And then uh, this morning here, we're baptizing Grace Lynn, who is sound asleep for now. We'll see how long that lasts. Um, But we are going to get started with a prayer. God, who is rich in mercy and love, gives us a new birth into a living hope through the sacrament of baptism. By water and the word, God delivers us from sin and death and raises us to new life in Jesus Christ. We are united with all the baptized in the one body of Christ, anointed with the gift of the Holy Spirit, and joined in God's mission for the life of the world. Amen. So Stephen and Lizzie, called by the Holy Spirit, trusting in the grace and love of God, do you desire to have your daughter baptized into Christ? If so, say, I do. Called by the Holy Spirit, trusting in the grace and love of God, do you desire to have her baptized? As you bring her to receive the gift of baptism, you are entrusted with responsibilities to live with her among God's faithful people, to bring her to the word of God and the Holy Supper, to teach her the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments, to place in her hands the Holy Scriptures and nurture her in faith and prayer so that your daughter may learn to trust God, proclaim Christ through word and deed, care for others in the world God made, and work for justice and peace. Do you promise to help her grow in the Christian faith and life? If so, say, I do. Ashley and Hunter, as sponsors, do you promise to nurture her in the Christian faith as you are empowered by God's spirit to help her live in the covenant of baptism and in communion with the church? If so, say, I do. People of God, do you promise to support Gracelyn and pray for her in her new life in Christ? If so, say, we do. do. All right, if you want to step forward here. Gracelyn, Renee, Adi, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, shoot, there you are. All right, I can drip everywhere. There we go. All right, still asleep, so that's... (laughs) You belong to Christ in whom you have been baptized. Alleluia. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, that through water and the Holy Spirit, you give your daughters and sons new birth, cleanse them from sin, and raise them to eternal life. Sustain Graceland Renee Adi with the gifts of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. Graceland, child of God, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. Amen. At each baptism, we light a candle that reminds us that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. It reminds us of the presence of the Holy Spirit that is in each and every one of us. And we invite you to light this candle on the the birthday of her baptism every year um, as a reminder of this day. It reminds us that Jesus told us to let our light so shine before others that they may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. We're gonna put this over here though, just in case she wakes up. Thank you. And people of God, if you would, with me, um, read the response that is on the screen and welcome the newly baptized. We welcome you into the body of Christ and into the mission we share. Join us in giving thanks and praise to God and bearing God's creative and redeeming word to all the world. And we have just a couple of gifts for you. So in the promises that you just made, we believe that it is, I'm gonna give the paperwork to you first, um, that it is kind of our role as a church to walk alongside you in those things. And so one of the promises is that she would have um, access to and read and know the scriptures. And so we have a, her very first little Jesus calling, it's a little bedtime Bible story book. And then, so she can feel the presence of God and Jesus and this uh, church that supports her. We have a blanket that was made by one of the women of the church. Your hands are full. I will put them over here. There you go. Thank you. All right. Let us welcome Gracelyn. Gracelyn. 
And you guys can go have a seat. Good. Who are you following? Everybody is following somebody or something. Put another way, everyone is a disciple. The question is not, are you a disciple? It's who or what are you a disciple of? 2,000 years ago, Jesus invited his first disciples to come and follow me. But what does it mean to follow Jesus today in our busy, digitally distracted, and increasingly secular cities? Over the last two millennia, millions of people have said yes to Jesus' invitation. It's changed not only their lives, but the course of human history. And it can do the same for you. So that was a video about a course that we're going to be offering uh, this coming May, and I'll talk about that more in just a moment. But first, I just want to say welcome, welcome to worship, good morning. I'm so glad that you're here, whether you're joining us in person or online. If you're a visitor with us this morning, there is a connection card, looks a lot like this, uh, in the seat pocket right in front of you. When you're ready to fill that out to connect with us, those can be dropped in the offering basket or left with the person uh, at the welcome desk this morning. Uh, we love having kids here in worship. A bunch of them just went down to Kid Zone. Um, if your child would like to join them, it is not too late. You can head down there. Um, we also have a parent child room right outside the doors, as well as video and sound in the lobby. If you need to step out for any reason, whether you or your child get the wiggles, we do not judge. So. Okay, well, <laughs> next uh, Sunday, make sure you get here just a little bit early. There is a um, pancake breakfast happening. Um, that uh, All the proceeds for that are going to go and help our high schoolers make their trip to Christicon this summer. Uh, lives are changed, and like the spiritual if, um, you know, experiences happen on these trips. And so any way that we can support our kids going on those trips is wonderful. So also pancakes. So... Um, we're starting a brand new series today called Playlist, and this morning we're kind of talking about what questions and ideas and themes are raised by the Grateful Dead that we can enter into and dive deeper into our faith, and what of those themes and questions does Jesus also speak into? So it's not every church this Sunday that's going to talk about the Grateful Dead, but we're doing it here, so we're pretty excited that you're here too. Um, we, like I said, there's this uh, class that is starting uh, in May called Practicing the Way, and it is based off of uh, this book, which even if you can't come to the class, you need to get this. I started it Friday, and I have five pages left. I have no pages left, but I had to come to church. So um, you're definitely going to pick up this book, even if you don't go through the class, but we really hope you do, because half of it is the discussion and the conversations that we can all learn from each other. So um, be on the lookout for more information. I think there's information in your worship guide. Um, about that as well. Uh, coming up in the beginning of May, also we are going to be uh, serving Path to Home again. This is when we invite people who are currently experiencing homelessness into our church and we offer them housing for a week. There are all kinds of ways that we can serve to make this happen. Um, some ro uh, roles are already filling up, so uh, to, if you want to get started serving in that ministry, uh, make sure you see the information in the worship guide or on the church website or on the Facebook page. Uh, there's all kinds of information on how to serve out there. As always, we have our prayer table set up. We will have someone in our prayer room uh, right after worship outside the doors. You can always come and find a pastor. We would love to pray with you as well. And offering information can be found in your uh, worship guides as well. We are so glad you are here this morning. And I think the band might have one more song. I don't know who it's by. We'll find out. Looks 
Okay, we just did a Grateful Dead tune in church. I think somebody better start praying. <laughs> Who's the senior pastor here? I want to talk to him about this. So uh, let's bow our heads and pray. 
Lord, we pray at this time that you would silence in each of us any voice but yours. That hearing your word we may believe, and believing your word we may obey your will. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I was in the back there, and I heard the lyrics, what a long, strange trip it's been. And I was thinking, that's, pro that's your life, right? <laughs> See, at least mine. I've been here 23 years, probably all of us. But, you know, years ago when I was a mission developer, when I was starting a new church, there were all kinds of surveys done of people who didn't go to church. And, and two of the really big ones were that it's boring, right? And, and the second one, that is, it's completely irrelevant to my life. It doesn't speak into my world. They're not speaking the same language. They're not living where I live. And so one of the things that I thought when I started, this goes way back to 1996, is when I do church, you know, we're not going to be boring, okay? And uh, I think that was pretty exciting. Myself, they are pretty, pretty good. The band was kind of excited when I walked up. Hey, you guys know any Grateful Dead tunes? <laughs> and I, well, yeah. And then secondly, you know, we're not going to be the church. It's irrelevant. And the truth is that your, your radio preset is probably not set to organ music, okay? The, the, your organ music, your, excuse me, your radio presets may have KTIS on it, maybe not. But, you know, for the most part, we live in a society that's listened to tons and tons of secular music. And, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. But, you know what, all the music that we're always listening to, all the messages that we always get, all the tunes, you know what they do is over time they shape us and they form us and they become part of who we are from the inside. And good songs that we listen to ask good questions. But good questions, you know what they need? Good questions need the good news. So we're doing this series. Years ago when I became a pastor for the first time, I was serving in the south suburbs of uh, Milwaukee. I was in South Milwaukee to be specific. And a whole bunch of us had just begun. It was September. And, and one of them sent me an email, sent an email actually to a bunch of us. He said, hey, I was driving to church this morning. I was listening to Led Zeppelin. <laughs> this is a pastor. And, and he goes, is that allowed? <laughs> Am I, shouldn't I be like, shouldn't church music or something get in the mood? And so that's kind of the question that many of us ask. What do we do with all of this? And that's what we're going to break into in this series. I remember when I was a junior in college, and um, the roommate that I was also assigned to room with, we were in Iterbo Hall down at St. Olaf, the, the roommate that I was scheduled to live with uh, transferred over the summer. He went to Dana College down in Nebraska. I don't know if he didn't want to live with me or what, but he... He left, and a, a new roommate was assigned, and he moved in before I did. And, and when I walked into the room, he had already moved in. What I saw in the center of the room, just under the window, was a big wooden case full of cassette tapes. Some of you here, do you, do you remember cassette tapes, right? Yeah. Some of you, I, every, I bring up cassette tape to Emily, and she says, a what? You know, <laughs> and... And, and, you know, most times that you see something like that, you see a wide variety of bands, and I'm thinking, oh, this is great. He's got a lot of good music. This is awesome. You know, good stereo system, good music. This will be a good room. But I, I started looking at his, his cassette tapes. He didn't have a lot of bands. He had, like, he had one band, right? All the tapes were of one band, and the one band was The Grateful Dead. And, and I thought, Grateful Dead? I mean, who is that? I had no idea. You know, I was talking to Emily about this series. I said, yeah, we should do one on The Grateful Dead. And she said, The Grateful what? <laughs> um, and not only was this wood case of one band, not a collection of different bands, but none of the tapes had actually been purchased. Remember that when you could dub tapes? Yeah. Right? All his tapes were ripped off, right? <laughs> They were all copies, and I'm thinking, is this even legal? What is, what is all this about? And not only was it legal, but what was fascinating about this band is they encouraged people to do so. You know, come to our concerts, and you know, all these other bands, oh no, you can't record, it's illegal, you try and get a recorder, even videotape into one today. They said, bring your recorders and tape it and make copies, and then when you make copies, send it out, spread it to the world, you see a little bit of the gospel there, they're doing it better than we are. And, <laughs> send it out, use it, you know, make copies. And so I'm looking at these tapes and it's fascinating because they're all handwritten at the top. None of them are printed. None of them are fancy. And all of them are a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. 
And that's true. And he would listen nonstop when he was around, you know. And here were some of the songs, you know, Uncle John's Band, and, and there was Truckin', which, band, which uh, you know, the, the group did when I walked in, and there was Touch of Grey. And I mean, we hear lyrics in there, and just like the music that we love, you know, something, something strikes us and we ask about it, and something resonates, like, I will survive, right? I will get by. How many of us have ever not been in that situation? Nobody. We've all been in that. And sometimes when we're listening to songs, they speak to us. And what was even wilder is these guys talking about these cassette tapes that were all copied a million times over. You, you know why they would do that? They would say, oh, you got to listen to this song on this date at this venue. And why on earth would you even care? And I'm, I'm thinking it's the same song. Why, why does it matter? But you see, there, were, there was an entire movement going around what they thought was especially good. And when, when one song was better in a particular venue and this was all fascinating because here is what I was seeing happen and here is what was sort of opening itself up to me and what I was realizing simply as a passive observer is this this band was basically having their own version of church services huge concerts in stadiums and gatherings and there were people that would follow them across the country you know in the same way that often people go on pilgrimages they would go on pilgrimages and they would see and this group if if you look at the lyrics they have their own theology and they have their own liturgy and they have their own priests and prophets and their own practices and their own sound and their own followers and and their own services almost with tens of thousands of people going and I'm thinking you know what is that about it's no different today and I'll get to it later but when I was uh, looking at social media last June when Taylor Swift was here seeing the exact same thing what is it and what was fascinating about this band the Grateful Dead is they were basically having church services with everything but Jesus and by the way, those of you that are Orthodox, it's not church if you don't have Jesus, okay? <laughs> Just got to name that for you so that we don't... But there were some who said, you can find his message in there. If you look closely enough, well, we'll see. So we're starting this series today, Playlist. This is a 2024 edition. We've done something like this before. But here's the idea. In our society, there was once a time when there was a standard Orthodox, you know, kind of uh, uh, assemblage of thought and ideas and books that everybody knew that informed all of society and it was stuff like Shakespeare and the philosophers and there were poets and uh, philosophers like Plato and Aristotle and many of the key Bible stories. I mean, you read Lincoln and you read other stuff and, and this was just part of the culture. This was part of the society. This is what people read. There, there wasn't anything else. And as we all know now, I mean, that day is gone when people just had general knowledge of the same things, the things that shaped our society. And generations ago, it was fading away and it's gone. And not only is it not the case anymore, but nobody even remembers that there was a day like that when there was an age where there was a common cultural vocabulary. People even read the poets. And at my home, uh, uh, where I live up on, the, on my bookshelf, I have a collection of all the old classic, you know, texts from Western, you know, society, Western culture, and, and they're all grouped under a header called the, the Harvard Classics, and they're all from uh, my, my great uncle, my grandpa's uh, brother Arvid. That's the, the set of copies I have. They go back, I don't know, 100 years at least. Uh, but what's wild about that is that nobody reads that stuff anymore. And nobody knows any of that stuff anymore. Nobody reads poetry. What do we listen to? We don't read poetry, but we listen to poetry constantly. I love it when I get into someone's car sometimes, they're going to give me a ride somewhere, and you know they, they left their radio on when they turned the car off. Have you ever done this? And the radio was just blasting, so they turned their car back on. You know immediately what, what songs they listen to. It just comes blasting on, and oh, that's what you listen to. Okay. It's not church music. Okay. 
People listen to the poets constantly, and the poets and the voices of our world, who are they? They're the musicians, they're the songwriters, they're the lyricists, they're the people in the bands and the lyrics and their melodies. They constantly fill our spaces and our cars and our mind. Do you think there's any chance that that begins to shape how we see the world? You bet there is. And, and I love it. People all the time say, oh, I can't memorize scripture. Yeah, I don't, I don't, uh, I can't memorize, you know, I tried. I, I, the confirmants even, I say, hey, e shortest verse in the Bible, use that as your confirmation verse. It's Jesus wept, okay? You can memorize that verse, you know? It's not an inspiring confirmation verse, but you can memorize that one, but the, oh, no, I can't memorize anything. But, but you take a Taylor Swift song. I mean, my daughter Karen, she knows all of the lyrics. You take a Taylor Swift song, you take any song, and take the, the artist who's on your playlist. And you know all the lyrics, don't you? And when that song comes on, something happens, and you think about it, and the lyrics flow out of your mouths effortlessly. And, and even those Scandinavians and Germans among us, you'll even dance if you think no one's looking, right? Isn't that the truth? <laughs> And the most beloved poets of all, they don't entertain us. But you know what happens in our society, and that's what we're talking about today. They become movements. They become movements of people, and they fill stadiums, masses of devotees, follow them, devoted to their melodies and their message. Something has captured their hearts. So the question that I have for you today is simply this. What movement are you a part of? And I hope you'll answer that at the end of the message today. What movement are you a part of? And who has captured your heart deep down, deep within? And what do you really truly believe gives life? And what really guides you? And who is it that you listen to? I mean, you, you all have this, right? You have a song that you go back to or a song will come on the radio. And what do you think about? You think about a particular era in your life and then you think about the people in, those era, in that era and you think about who you were and what you were doing. And it's like something special has happened because something captured your heart in that. I don't care what age you are. And now I want you to compare that movement, what happens when you're listening to some of those songs. I want you to compare it to the way a lot of people view Christianity. And this is how a lot of people think about our faith. In church, you know, it's a set of beliefs, you know, I'm supposed to believe it. So yeah, okay, I believe it. You know, check the box, you know, I'm done. Uh, and, and we believe if you, if you believe the right information right, about God, if I believe the right things and don't believe the wrong things, then one day God's going to bless me and one day I'll go to heaven. God's going to stamp my eternal passport, right? And often people will say this, oh, I believe in God. I try to live a good life. What else matters? That's all that matters, right? And do you see what's happening? So often it's far from our hearts. I mean, there's this wonderful passage, I'm doing this off the top of my head, but it's, I think, in Revelation somewhere, but, but it's a passage where God says, hey, either be hot about the faith or be cold about it, but whatever you do, don't be lukewarm or I'm going to spit you out of my mouth, right? It's in the Bible. You can look it up. <laughs> and the question becomes, what are we? Is it just intellectual assent? Oh, yeah, I believe all that stuff. Here's what's interesting. Scripture teaches even the demons believe in God. Even the demons knew who Jesus was. Even Jesus, the demons believed in God, believed in Jesus. You see, Christianity never began as this set of doctrines to be believed one day so that when you die, you can go to heaven. That was not even on the radar of the early church. In fact, a lot of what we talk about wasn't even on the radar of the early church. And here's what I want you to catch today, and we've touched on this in the past. Christianity started as a movement of the Holy Spirit, a movement centered around a person, a movement centered around a way of life guided by that person, Jesus. And the whole movement is to invite you to follow Jesus closer and closer and more and more with your whole life and even when you fall off the wagon to get back on because he loves you and has invited you and wants to show you life. 
And that early movement of the early church had devotees, just like, you know, music, and people who had seen Jesus and had seen in Jesus what gives life, and people who had seen in Jesus the power of God, the same power, by the way, that's available to us today and available to us, the same power as we talked about on Easter that raised Jesus from the dead. That's also in Scripture. And people in this movement had seen something special in Jesus. And they, what, what did they do with that? Oh, yeah, I believe in that. That's a good doctrine, right? They didn't do anything like that. They became passionate about it, about knowing and living and being and gathering as this movement around Jesus. I mean, it was in their eyes, and they were serious about it. I was, I was in one of the high school basketball games, uh, um, I don't know, a couple months ago, and, and the momentum had gone to the other team, and the Cambridge coach, who's just great, he's famous, he, he brought in his players, and I could just see it in his eyes, and he was talking about the basics, and he was talking about getting focused again, and he was talking about, you know, I could just read into him, he said, get your mind in the game, and get focused, and be a team, and get this done, because this matters, and this is what we're trying to accomplish here. You see, he was passionate about it. We're called to be passionate about living and being and gathering as this movement, Jesus Christ. And early, you know, in, you know, often today we talk about Christians, and by the way, Christianity is booming through the world. It's only in the Western world where it's slowed down or is in decline. Christianity is booming because people that are persecuted and people who, who need something deeply in their lives are finding it in Jesus Christ. But... You know, what was interesting in the early churches, it wasn't called Christianity, and they weren't called Christians. By the way, that's only used three times in the Bible. You know what the early church was called? They were called people of the way because they were a part of a movement of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't a believe these doctrines. It was be a part of what God is doing in the world. You're invited. It was a movement, and there were defining characteristics about who they were and what they were about. And Scripture uses the word that describes who they were or disciples, scripture uses that word to describe them 256 times. We call ourselves Christians, but the question is, are we disciples? And disciple is being formed in the image of Christ. A disciple is someone who's being spiritually formed by Jesus. The church is a movement of disciples of Jesus. And so people in the early church, they had their own playlist. They had their own go-to stuff, and they didn't have a book where it was all written down, so they got together in a small group. If you're not in a small group, talk to Emily. It's her sole purpose in life is to get you into a small group, okay? And they talked about it, their own way of being. What does it mean to be a disciple? And everybody today, Christian or non-Christian, disciple or non-disciple, has a playlist, has a soundtrack, and the question for all of us here today is, what's yours? What's your playlist? What's your soundtrack? Because the truth is, you have a soundtrack. And you know, there are lots of people, I run into them lots, you know, I talked about being here 23 years, that's kind of become a, keep talking about that this year, I must feel like that's a long time or something, but there are lots of people who say that they are a Christian, and that's, that's a good thing. We want people identifying as Christians. But, you know, sometimes I ask them, hey, oh, that's great. Do you go to church? Well, no, I, I don't actually go to, I don't have a church. I don't really go. Uh, and by the way, some of these conversations happen just because I'm a pastor, and people either want to talk about church or they fold their arms, and they're not going anywhere near it. But that's often the conversations I have. People will bring them up. I'll say, oh, yeah, do you go to church? Do you have a church here? Probably, no, no, we don't actually go to church. You know, we're, we're a member of a church. We don't actually go. And okay, and, you know, it's not the end of the world. Do you, do you read your Bible? Well, no, I don't, I don't read the Bible, actually, to be truthful. It's kind of like when the dentist asks you if you floss. I mean, what do you say, right? <laughs> You know, I got asked that question about a month ago. I just was honest. I said, nope, I don't floss. I'm going to try harder, believe me. You know, the Bible, uh, flossing is a notional value. I believe in flossing. I don't do it, right? Well, occasionally, you know. I, I'll try more just so that I can talk about it in a future sermon. But... Um, <laughs> People say, oh, yeah, you know, I don't read my Bible. That's why we've been talking about the one-year Bible is here, because the one-year Bible is an easy, fabulous way to get into the Bible every day. Just read the New Testament. 
You know, but people don't read their Bibles. Biblical literacy is, is incredibly low. It's even worse in Lutheran churches. And, you know, and people think, I wouldn't know where to begin. And we ask people, do you pray? Well, yeah, I pray you know, when I'm in trouble, when I need something, but it's not really in a relational way. It's just sort of, yeah, you know. And, and are you serving anyone or anything in Jesus' name? And the answer is kind of like, you know, and I try not to ask it in such religious language, but I'm boiling it down. And they'll say, well, I try and lead a good life. You know, I try and do good things. And it's, I think it's fair to ask, is that being part of a movement? Is that passionate discipleship? Or is that kind of passive assent to a bunch of ideas that I think I'm supposed to believe in because my mom told me? You see, Jesus often spoke about living life, quote, in my name. And Jesus said, whenever you do anything in my name, you do it for me, he said. And this, Jesus wasn't saying, hey, you got to do more good stuff that we tend to hear from a lot of, you know, people in Christianity. Sometimes when we hear we're supposed to do, we're supposed to do more good stuff, we kind of, you know, we, I have enough on my to-do list. I can't add a single thing. Christianity was about being passionate for the most important message in human history. And as we talked about on Easter, it's the message that changes everything, the life, death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do we passionately believe that? That's what belief is. We have lots of people who think they're members of this church. I love it. Great. I, I want to hear that, but they don't like actually show up or participate. They, they come see me sometimes and say, I've been a member of this church, right, forever. And I, well, I've been here 23 years. Really nice to meet you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, what does it even mean? And I don't go into it because it doesn't matter. It's a number. It's, it's a label. But Christianity isn't about the label. You see, people who love Jesus and are a part of his movement, they find a way to express that. And I loved it. When I was in the Chicago suburbs, you know, my suburb was 71% unchurched. And we define that as having no significant activity in a church. You know, just not going. They weren't against it. They just, you know, life is full. And they just weren't there. And so if people weren't going to anywhere to church, I'd invite them, hey, come to my church. And we were doing things differently. The Horizon Service is basically the evolution of exactly what I was doing in Chicago. Started doing this in October of 1997. And I learned to absolutely love the Catholics in our area. It was 85% Catholic background. I just loved them because you know what they did? They sh if I invited them, they showed up at my church week after week after week. Attendance, that was a high value and they never missed. God bless them. You know what was even better is they had a lot of kids, right? <laughs> and they filled a lot of seats, right? And, and our, one of our lead musicians, he, he was someone, he hadn't gone to church ever since he was a little kid. And he, his wife dragged him along, and then he started coming, and then he started getting his guitars out, and then he started playing in our band, and then he started recording CDs. About who? About Jesus. Do you see the difference in, how, in, in, in these different comparisons? And the person who oversaw our communion every Sunday was a Catholic background. The president of our church was Catholic. All these families, you know, God bless them all. Because he said, you know what, we're going to show up and we're going to be a part of the movement and we're going to find our way. And, and here's what was even interesting that didn't bother me. All the tell, a lot of them, not all of them, would tell me, hey, you know what, by the way, I'm never going to join your church. Okay. <laughs> what, what's wrong with us, right? But it was because they were, they, they were part of the Catholic Church, but they said they're going to be here. And that also raises the important question, what matters more? Is it being part of the movement? We're putting a certain label on you. Every Sunday they were here because they were part of the movement of Jesus. It wasn't the denomination. It was being around the body and blood, the Holy Spirit, what God is doing in the world, and just making that a part of your life and making that an hour and gathering around the word and gathering around the music and just hearing your life, having kind of that grounding, hearing and seeing your life centered in at least one or two verses from a particular week. And again, you know, many times people show up, they tell me I'm members, that's great. Uh, but it's not about membership. And by the way, if someone shows up, they, they think that if they're a member, they, they, you know, we're going to treat them better. We treat everybody as best as we can. And we, you know, the church is the only institution that exists for the benefit of its non-members. Okay, and that is just so important. I think we, we got Path to Home coming up in a couple of weeks. We don't ask people before we help them with a place to sleep and before we give them food. We don't say, hey, are you a member or not? Right, it's not, nothing about that. 
Here's the big question. What movement are you in? What movement are you in? And here's what we're thinking about as we start this series. It's not about whether your name's on the list or not. And by the way, I'm pro-membership. Membership is a sign of commitment. I'm going to make a formal commitment to Jesus Church to be a part of it and to live those values as best as I can out in my own life. And by the way, some people feel they're unworthy. Here's the truth. We're all unworthy. No one measures up. It's not about whether our name is on a list. It's about, am I following Jesus? Am I actively seeking him in my life? Is the movement of Jesus claiming your energy and your attention and your heart? And is there evidence in your life by which someone could convict you of being a follower of Jesus? And if not, the answer is not guilt. The answer is, hey, you're invited. And if you think Jesus is a good thing, and here's what's wild in society today. The church is on decline numerically, at least in the United States, but Jesus' popularity is as big, or, big as ever. A lot of people will use this cliche. They say, oh, I like Jesus, I just don't like the church. It's like saying, oh, I like you, I just don't like your wife, okay? <laughs> hey, don't say that, okay? Because... <laughs> Because the church is the bride of Christ. The church is this imperfect being. Uh, but what we say is, here's what Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. All four of those things. That's what the movement of Jesus in the world, the old word for it was ecclesia, which is a better word than church. That's, it's because it implies moving somewhere. If you're on a team and you're never improving, is that good? No, that's bad. You want to be on a team improving. You want to be a team where you're increasing your energies and your attention. And we have a movement called Christianity. And you're invited to be a disciple. And if you don't want to participate here, that's okay. Participate somewhere. But here's the truth. No matter what we say, you are being formed by someone or something all the time. Could be our favorite music or podcasts or books or activities or hobby or work or whatever it might be. Mark Comer, Mark John, uh, John Mark Comer, who you saw the, the, the video about practicing the way about. He's got, I've been reading this book, the one Emily held up, and he's, he's got this quote. He said, you, have, you are being, you have been being, it's really bad grammar, by the way. You have been being spiritually formed since before you came out of your mother's womb. You're being spiritually formed all the time, is this point all of us have. And then he continues, it's, it's not whether you're good or bad, he just says non-apprentices of Jesus, in other words, non-disciples, are just people who intentionally ar arrange their lives around anything else. And that's okay, those aren't bad things, but the challenge is to arrange your life around Jesus, to be a part of the movement. And if somebody asked you again what movement you're a part of, What's your answer? And here's the truth about your soundtrack. You have a soundtrack, but it's probably not the hymnal. I, I grew up as one of these church kids. I mean, I, I, all, I was going to have our kids just have uh, their whole life. I was going to have them in church every single Sunday so we could say there was never a Sunday they had missed church, right? Uh, didn't happen, by the way. Uh, but I was close to that. I was like a little kid. Every Sunday I was in church. Often I was at multiple services. I was at youth group. I was, you know... And, and so in some ways, my soundtrack was uh, the hymnal, you know, but for 95% of our people, especially our younger people, that's not the case at all. We want the words and the sounds and the movement of Jesus to become more and more part of and eventually our soundtrack, our playlist. You know, any of you that grew up Lutheran, I have page 56 memorized, right? I'll take you on. <laughs> but everybody's following somebody or something. Said differently, everyone's a disciple. And the question isn't, are you a disciple? The question is, who or what are you a disciple of? Jesus said this about being formed in his image in the book of Luke. He said, the student is not above the teacher. But everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. And if you want to be part of the movement, if you want to be formed spiritually by Jesus, Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. Because the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you 
unless you abide in me. I want to be a part of the movement. Abide in Christ. So often when the church talks about, you know, secular culture tunes like we're talking about, it's based on this kind of false righteousness. We're the good guys, they're the bad guys. Instead of going down that road, by the way, this sermon isn't about the Grateful Dead. And none of the sermons in this series are about the band. What these sermons are about is how our culture and our music, they point us to our need for something greater. And when you see the secular, you know, we're not called to just condemn it. We're called to find the sacred in it. Jesus' followers see the hand of God at work wherever they're looking. And Jesus' followers know that we're not so righteous that we can just dismiss everybody but us. And we also know that all truth comes from God. Listen to Ephesians. There is one God and Father of all, all, who is over all, all again, and through all, third time we hear that word, and in all. God is at work in the world. We're invited to see where God is at work and join it. So again, the 24, uh, 2024 edition of Playlist originated last June, last summer, I think it was, when I was just looking at my social media feeds and I saw this sea of selfies from people that had taken shots, I don't know if it's legal or not, from the um, Taylor Swift concert. And it, it was like people deep in a worship experience. And there were 120,000 people that went. Instead of condemning bands and groups and people, what truths do we see in that? Because when that happens, something's happening there. And good bands ask good questions, and good questions lead us to the good news of Jesus Christ. And the unique good news of Jesus can't be found anywhere but in the life and the death and the resurrection. So we welcome the poets and the musicians who lift up the yearnings of the human heart and we seek to discern where Jesus answers the questions that they raise. Listen to a few questions in one of the songs, Uncle John's Band. It's, are you kind? Will you go with me? Where does the time go? How does the song go? Each of those, we could do a Biblical exegesis. See, answers are found in Jesus Christ. So are you in the movement of Jesus? Well, here's what you're invited to do, is to be spiritually formed by a Jewish rabbi and to choose a new playlist, his playlist. And he would invite fishermen. He'd say, hey, come follow me. And they'd get up and they'd go. He walked up to ordinary people like you and me and invited them to be his disciples, to learn to do life in his name. And here was his invitation to crowds. He said, the time is now fulfilled, meaning the time has come. The kingdom of God is near, meaning the presence of God is now here and available to you. Repent, which means turn, and believe the good news, which, becomes, which means become part of the movement. Believe the gospel, the good news. Something new has happened. The presence of God is available. Live in the presence of God, the kingdom of God, and God will do amazing things. And here's Jesus' invitation to you. Seek first the kingdom. Make it a part of your life. Be a part of the movement. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all those other things that you're worried about that you're going to lose, you think, Jesus says, and all these things will be added unto you. I mean, even in money, especially, oh, I don't know if I can get to the church. You know, we don't, I don't know if we, you know. What amazing spiritual truth. You can't outgive God. God blesses your life. We fear what we'll lose. What is it going to cost? You can't outgive God. Follow me. And Jesus is saying, all the rest of what you're worrying about is going to be added unto you. It doesn't mean, by the way, nothing bad is going to ever happen. Here's the problem with the name, the Grateful Dead, is what will actually make us grateful isn't found there. And we're not going to be grateful when we die. 
the, you know, great lead singer. I was going to put a picture of him on the screen here, Jerry Garcia. He's been dead, I think, since 1995. Everything they talked about will one day fade. But people with grateful hearts will still be talking about Easter and the resurrection of Jesus. Scripture says sometimes we could even be dead now because we're dead in our sins. And we're only really alive when we've experienced the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And the other side of the tomb is resurrection. It's really about your resurrection. That through faith is available to you. Jesus says that eternal life doesn't begin when you die. Eternal life begins today. Jesus called that life in all of its abundance, and it's described all over Scripture as joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what we're talking about. And if there's anything to be grateful for, that's the message. And Easter is meant to be experienced personally. You know, wouldn't it be easier like Thomas if we could peek into the tomb? I preached on Thomas last week in the sanctuary. Disciple Thomas, he said what a lot of us would say, hey, I'd believe if I actually was able to touch Jesus. And then who shows up? Jesus. And Jesus says, blessed are those who haven't seen, but still believe. We're going to have some fun with the music in this series. And, you know, I don't, by the way, endorse all the lyrics. But I do endorse the questions, and I do endorse entering into the questions and finding the answers in Jesus Christ. And what we're truly grateful for is the good news of Jesus Christ, who wasn't grateful for death. He overcame death in the grave, and he continues to live and walk among us today and in our lives through the Holy Spirit, renewing people and changing futures. And he invites us to invite him into our life. Abide in me, he said. And to live in his kingdom and commit our lives to you. The question of Easter was simply this. Are you willing to give your life to the one who gave his life for you? It's really the challenge. And he declares to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us bow our heads and pray. Lord, we give you thanks for the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. For that, we are grateful. We pray that you would help us to receive his call, to follow him. We say in our hearts at this time, yes, we, we give you our lives, and we invite your presence within us. And we pray that you would abide in us, that we may abide in you. We pray at this time the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you God's peace. Amen. Go in peace. I can see the clouds rolling. I can feel the winds. They try to shake me. I will not be moved. My feet are on the rock.